Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. We just finished our demonstration on VirtualBox's snapshot and cloning technology, and now we want to explore the storage and network technology that are built into Oracle's VirtualBox hypervisor. With just a decent laptop or desktop PC, you can use SAS controllers, NVMe controllers, and multiple hard disks. You can experiment with RAID and Microsoft storage spaces. VirtualBox will emulate several popular SAS controllers, parallel SCSI controllers, SATA controllers, even an iSCSI interface. And depending on your guest operating system's drivers, you can connect, say in Windows 11, up to eight devices on some of these controllers. Windows then and Linux can allow you to try out many RAID options on VirtualBox. Keep in mind that the best way to learn and get value out of any training, including what you get on YouTube, is to take the time and experiment with the software yourself. Education research is clear that listening to training, you retain about 15% of what you learn. But taking that extra step to actually doing what you learned, your retention jumps to 80%. I encourage anyone serious in IT, carve out some time and either use Hyper-V or Oracle's VirtualBox to gain that invaluable exposure to hypervisors and all the important technology that you can leverage by using either a Type 1 or Type 2 hypervisor. In addition to storage technologies, when we use VirtualBox, we're also going to look at network topologies that are built in. Look at some of the practical uses for each of them. You can configure many complex network scenarios and learn to configure servers and PCs to work on them. And last, we're going to look at VirtualBox Manage.exe, which provides a rich command line interface to all of VirtualBox's features, allow scripting, automation to your virtual environment. Now, as we start talking about advanced storage technologies with VirtualBox, it's humorous to realize that VirtualBox does an incredible job of supporting legacy devices, legacy IDE controllers, parallel SCSI, which are all old technology. And at first you would think, why? What, what, what do we care about an IDE hard drive? Well, there's still a lot of XP manufacturing equipment. There's a lot of medical devices that are still running XP, and they are using IDE hard drives. There are still controllers out there for parallel SCSI, so VirtualBox supports that. They obviously also support NVMe, the SAS controllers, as well as iSCSI and SATA. So although VirtualBox is going to provide you these controllers, it's up to your guest operating system and its ability to have driver support for that controller. That's the big issue. Drivers are really important for the guest operating system as it will dictate whether you can use a controller or not. So here I've got Windows 11 beta and you can see beta is having a lot of trouble with NVMe controller that I've got installed and my parallel SCSI controller. The rest of them it had driver support. Now once Windows 11 reaches full production, this might all clear up. So if you're not as familiar with some of the old controllers, VirtualBox supports a number of the IDE controller chipsets. We also support the SATA, the AHCI, the Advanced Host Controller Interface. There is the ability to download Intel's matrix storage drivers that can be installed in some guest operating systems to make this a little bit more efficient. The LSI Logic SCSI Parallel Controller. This works great for Windows uh, 2003 and later because it ships with those type drivers. There's also a Bus Logic SCSI Parallel Controller. Works great with NT40 and Windows 2000 server. Those operating systems ship with those type drivers. Now this is an older LSI SCSI Parallel Controller. It's a great for older operating systems and you can put up to 15 hard drives on this. This is the Bus Logic SCSI controller. It works 
works for those older operating systems. Again, this will run at least 15 hard drives on this controller. Now the new LSI Logic SAS controller, which is serial attached SCSI, enables more reliable and faster connections. Now the controller allows 255 devices, but you have to check out your device driver and that will determine how many devices can be connected. This does have a 6 gigabit interface transfer rate. Newer controllers run at about 12 gigabits per second. This is a LSI controller and it has 6 gigabits of transfer rate and this will support up to to four SAS hard drives. Now let's be perfectly clear. VirtualBox's emulated hardware controllers are no match for a real hardware controller. They don't provide any of the things like RAID migration, RAID striping size, RAID spare disks, rebuild times, priority settings, and all that other capability that's found in hardware controllers. I've got a number of videos. One I did on HP Smart RAID. I did also another one on maximizing your RAID performance, and these are all hardware RAID controllers. What you do get out of a software emulated controller is the ability to put lots of disks on a controller, allowing you to take advantage of a lot of software RAID. Microsoft supports software RAID. Linux supports software RAID. There are third-party software RAID products that are just amazing. You still want to take time and learn hardware storage controllers. But right now, this gives you a place to start with at least exploring lots of software RAID options. Here's an example of driver issues. This is a Windows 11 beta, and I've added my LSI adapter SAS controller, and the driver that installed gave me at least eight ports, so I can put up to eight hard drives on this controller. They do have an NVMe controller. Just be aware that it's part of the extension pack for Oracle Box. You have to add it in addition to Oracle Box. You can boot drives using NVMe only if you're using the U the UEFI BIOS configuration. Up to 255 devices can be connected if the operating system supports it. Now VirtualBox also supports USB support, floppy driver support, so if you have an operating system that needs a floppy disk, then you also have iSCSI, but it is strictly command line and you can use your vbox.exe to configure an iSCSI connection. So I'm going to show you what I've done already in Windows 11, and then I'll take you step by step in Server 2022. So you can see I'm looking at my Windows 11 VM. I'm going to go to Settings and go to Storage. Now I'm actually booting Windows 11 off the SATA controller. You can see my VDI here, and this is actually my hard drive representing Windows 11. Then I added a number of controllers. I added an NVMe. I had to add the extension pack for first to my Oracle box. Then I also added a LSI Logic 2, which is a old parallel SCSI controller, and we'll see how Windows 11 likes that. And then I added, of course, the LSI Logic SAS controller. These are all emulated, and I've added three hard drives to that. Now, this is Windows 11 beta, so there we can't judge Windows 11 by beta. So it could, a lot of this could be fixed in a full production version of Windows 11. So let's first look at Device Manager, and you can see my adapter. This is my SAS controller. I also have Microsoft Storage Spaces running right now, which gives us an emulated storage controller. Very interesting. A simulated storage controller running on top of emulated storage controllers. How about that? Then I've got the NVMe Express controller, but notice the driver. It doesn't like something. I might be able to use Intel's NVMe software. That might fix it. I haven't tried it. And then I've got this SCSI controller controller, the old parallel SCSI controller, and Windows 11 doesn't have the driver for that. I've checked updates. It still didn't have it. But the SAS is working, and that's fine. What I've done with my three hard drives is I've actually enabled storage spaces. So I've got a two-way mirror, a drive E, and I'm using three of those disks to make this storage space drive. This is cool, and this is what you really want to be able to do with VirtualBox, is really get in here and explore. You can wipe this out, start all over again, and try different types of storage space configurations. There's a number. You can add more hard drives, up to eight. So you can do just about any configuration and storage spaces using this SAS controller. Very nice. Now, as I 
return to my server, I notice that it is froze. And here's an opportunity to show you how to leverage the bottom of the Oracle Box's icons to help me indicate what's going on. If you notice, this icon indicates disk activity. I don't see a light flashing. That tells me there's no hard drive activity. That's not good, a server with no hard drive activity. I can see some lights flashing on the network icon, which means network data is flowing in and out. That's interesting, but no disk activity. So I don't know what's going on here, but I have no control. I can't send a control alt delete to it. So it looks like I'm going to have to jerk the plug on this server. Before I shut down the server, I pulled up session information on this server that appears to be locked up. And I do see good things. I do see a CPU load, RAM usage, network data moving in and out. That at least indicates processes and the kernel are functioning. May need to just cool my jets and let this server finish. Maybe the updates are tying up the system and I need to just relax, chill, and let this thing do its thing. So I eventually did have to pull the plug on this server 2022. So we're back in uh, form here. Let's go look at our settings for this server and we'll pull up our hardware settings and go to storage. And so you can see I've just got a SATA controller in this server, which is very rare. You don't usually use SATA in a server. Usually it's going to be SAS. And I've got one VDI that basically is the server 2022 hard drive. So to change the server, I'm going to go ahead and shut down because we have to be in a shutdown state to add controller. So we're going to go ahead and shut down. And let's go into our settings and let's add a SAS controller. So I'm going to go to storage. Here you can see we can add new storage controller. So I'm just going to slide down here and get the LSI Logic SAS controller. Now we have a SAS controller. Hopefully server 2022 will automatically add a driver. We could boot it up to see, but I feel confident that it does. Let's go ahead and add some hard drives to it. If you look at our controller, you'll see two icons. One's a CD-ROM or CD icon. The other one is a hard drive icon. So if I wanted to add a DVD or some, some optical device, I could just click that and I would add that. But over here, we see a little hard drive and it's going to allow me to add hard drive. So I'm going to create some new ones. So I'm going to say create and I'm going to use the VDI, the, the default file format that is used by Oracle Box for hard drives. Go next. We're going to use a dynamically allocated and we'll just use 50 gigs. That's fine. And I want to make sure it's in the right place. So remember, make sure your files are in the right place. And this is in the right location. So I'm going to say create and it's going to add another hard drive. So notice in this graphical user interface, it shows me a bunch of hard drives that are attached to various virtual boxes in my, my virtual box manager. But this one right here, it says not attached. It's not attached to anything. It's just the one that I just created. Highlight that one that is not attached and say OK. And notice it put it right on that controller. So let's add another one. We can do this all day. We'll create another hard drive, another VDI, another dynamic. 50 gigs is fine. And we'll go ahead and slide down here to what is not attached. Notice it uses the same name and it adds a, a variable one, two, and we'll just keep doing this. I'm going to add another hard drive. It's that easy to add hard drives. Very nice. Keep going. And now we have dot two dot three. We'll go ahead and choose that one. Okay, we've added eight hard drives to my SAS controller. We've got to first boot up Windows 2022 to see what kind of driver it will install and if it will give me eight ports. I'm hoping it will. And then we can start having fun. So let's go ahead and boot up our server. Start. I'm going to go ahead and log on. So we'll watch our server. So I've opened up device manager and it did install a driver for the 3000 series SAS controller 8 port. So we're good. So now I've launched disk management and let's take a look and see what we have here. We've got disk one. That's a 50 gig. We've got a lot of 50 gigs here. All of them are showing up. What we need to do now is get them all initiated get them on our system so then we can play with them in terms of RAID. So I'll do one. Let's go do here. Let's get it online. Initialize the disk. We'll do disk one. Let's do GPT. So I spared you the pain of watching me do all of this. So I went ahead and finished all of our disks. 
I use GPT and I realize now if I'm going to use some of the old RAID technology built into Windows, not storage spaces, but the old type of RAID, I really need to convert these all into dynamic. So I'm going to go ahead and convert them to dynamic. I'm going to leave disk zero, my boot disk alone, but I'm going to go ahead and check all these boxes and I'm going to convert all these to dynamic because then I can play with Microsoft's built-in RAID. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now you can see my disks are no longer basic, but they're dynamic. Now I can do all kinds of things. Mirror, uh, new mirrored volume, new stripe volume, new span volume, new RAID 5. How about that? So let's go. And now I can choose. I can add disk 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If I want to do it that way, go ahead and go next. And I can assign a drive letter if I want. Let's go next. We'll just do D, NTFS, call this RAID 5, give it a volume name. We'll perform a quick format and say next and say OK. And now, just that quick, I've built an 8 disk RAID 5 array on server 2022. You can see my light blue color at the top of each of the drives indicating it's a RAID 5 volume. That's just one thing that we could do real quick with a SAS emulated controller, a few hard disks, and you can start playing with RAID 5. We're going to explore now VirtualBox networking. VirtualBox can supply to a VM up to eight virtual network adapters. Four can be configured via the GUI. The others have to be configured via the command line or vboxmanage.exe. It supports up to six different NICs. It does support jumbo frames, and that is Ethernet frames larger than 1500 bytes. These are the network cards that it supports. It, it does support para-virtualization network adapters, and they give you the best performance, but you do have to do some extra work to use them. If you're trying to squeeze the most out of your network, you're going to have to use your para-virtualized network cards, but the guest operating system must provide a special software interface. This avoids complex emulation of network hardware and pretty much improves your network performance. The open source project that is supporting this type of driver is KVM. It's a kernel-based virtual machine, open source, full virtualization solution for Linux, but they also supply these drivers. So you can get Windows 64-bit uh, drivers, but you do have to sign them yourself. Let's take a quick look at VirtualBox network modes. So this is my video server, and I realize it's busy, but if you look at Device Manager and look at my network adapters, I want you to focus on this one. This is my real, genuine, wired, one gigabit network jack on the back of my motherboard. I have another real one, Realtek 2.5 gigabit network jack on my motherboard. And then I have a USB wireless. So I really only have three network connections on this particular motherboard. So when I install Oracle VirtualBox, it installed a virtualized Ethernet adapter for my Gigabit Intel and a, a Ethernet virtualized adapter for my 2.5. It really doesn't mess with the wireless. You can, but right now it definitely makes a virtualized host NIC for each of the wired jacks that I have on the motherboard. You can see Hyper-V goes crazy. We'll get into that in other lectures. But that's what Oracle Box does when it installs. Now, why why is this important? Because as we get into some of the VirtualBox network types, we're going to take advantage of those VirtualBox host adapters. Now, VirtualBox supports a number of network nodes. Notice in the graphic, we've got every adapter you can assign a different network mode. Each of these are complex. So let's take a look at each and every one of these network modes. The first choice is you've just not plugged in the cable. Pretty straightforward. You have the NAT mode, which is the default, but you can change it. Then we have NAT network, which is very similar to what you have with your ISP at home. Then we have the bridge adapter. We have an internal network type, which is a completely isolated network you can build. Host only adapter type, and then the generic driver. 
Keep in mind the three network modes that are in red give you the best performance. So this chart kind of gives us a quick overview of these network modes. If you look on the left hand side, you have the different network modes. On the top, the communication. On the furthest left column, you have VM to VM communication, VM to host communication, host to VM communication, and as you can see, etc. So you can look at each of these and see exactly the impact as you choose each network mode, how that's going to impact the different types of communication. So what are the practical uses for this kind of advanced network? Well, one, you can create lots of multiple NICs and you can play with that kind of environment, having four network cards. NIC teaming, if you get into Windows Server, you can actually take advantage of NIC teaming. And you can look at servers connected to multiple subnets. You can do NAT and port forwarding. Lab work, you can build a lab network totally isolated from a production network. You can build a backup network versus your production network, and you can do bridging. So let me throw my two cents in here. Having taught thousands of students, I saw the large majority of them struggle mastering advanced networking. It's a tough subject, including their instructor. I had to work really hard to gain an understanding of networking. It's not an easy topic. Now, there are always people that pick it up with ease. That's fine. That's great. But most of you are going to have to work really, really hard to get a good understanding of networking and especially advanced networking. But do it. Networking is the key to everything in IT. So put the time and the effort. It does pay off in the long run. The first network type we're going to look at is NAT. It's simple. It gives you very high isolation from external devices to your guest operating system. So network address translation or the NAT mode is the simplest way of accessing the external network from a virtual machine. It provides the best isolation from external devices. If you plan on using just one virtual machine or two virtual machines, you can put them on that, they're fine. If you're using your virtual machine to connect to a malware site or a suspect HTTP URL, then you definitely want to be NAT. Now, in this slide deck, I have some great diagrams. If you're new to networking or still struggling with learning networking, stop and take your time to download these slide decks, our notes, and study these network diagrams. They really do help you start to understand and grasp subnetting, network structures and topologies. So this network mode, notice every single client gets its own NAT router. So they have their own gateway. Notice they all have the exact same IP address because they're completely isolated from each other. This is the default. You don't have to do it this way. There are other choices. Now the next networking mode is called NAT networking. It's different than NAT. NAT networking is a different type of NAT. It's just like your home. You've got a router, you have a main central NAT device and a firewall and a router and everybody else is behind that device. It gives you good isolation. It's not good if you're trying to host servers on VirtualBox because then you have to port forward to get through them. Now NAT networking basically allows the VirtualBox to act as a DHCP server. You get a NAT engine that translates private IP addresses to public if that's the case. The internet sees your virtual box as the origination of traffic. No configuration is needed on host or guest. It's great for guest OSs that are clients. It's not good for a server environment. Here's a network diagram of NAT networking mode. You'll see that you only have one router, one gateway, one NAT device for all the virtual machines that you have hosted. Keep in mind the IP addresses that are assigned are assigned by default. You can change all of this right now. You can see you get 10 dot numbers, which are the class A private IP addresses. But all these IP addresses you can change, but you have to use vboxmanage.exe, which is the command line interface. Now I deliberately added different pictorials of the same exact network diagram. So in the slide deck, if you look, you'll see more than one pictorial diagram of the same topology. Sometimes that's really helpful. Just seeing it a different way from a different perspective helps in understanding. Here's another pictorial diagram of that same topology. So I encourage you, if you're starting to grasp these concepts, look at all these diagrams. Now, anytime you use a NAT or NAT networking, if you want to access those guest operating systems, you're going to have to do port forwarding. 
Now your bridge networking mode allows you to bring a network switch into the whole network. There's no more isolation, no protection. You're, you're wide open. Everything that you have on your virtual box, hanging off your virtual box, and everything on your local area network is visible to each other. This is great if you're hosting servers and you want everyone to see them. This is really good for production environments. Remember, in bridging, wireless NICs do not work well with bridging. So just be aware if you're dealing with a wireless NIC, you're probably going to have a hard time getting into the bridge mode. Here's a basic pictorial of the topology of bridge mode. Remember, everybody sees everybody because we put switches in. There's no more NAT boxes. There's no more anything to isolate. Everybody sees everybody. This is another pictorial of the same topology, bridge networking. This is another pictorial of the same bridge topology. Very helpful when you're as you're trying to master these concepts. Now, another network type is called internal network type, and it gives you the ability to build an entire network, but with complete isolation from the production network. In an internal network type, all the guests can see each other. Hosts cannot see the internal network. Even the host is isolated. Network configuration is needed. This is great for multi-tier solutions. And anytime you want to do a isolated lab environment, completely isolated from your production environment. So here's a great pictorial of the internal network type. You can see all the guests can see each other. There's no problem with them communicating and talking, but notice they cannot talk to the external network, not even to the host. Here's another view of that same topology. Here's a different view of that same topology. One of the nice things about the internal network type is it's got some real practical uses. Let's say I want to build at home a entire Active Directory network. I could build domain controllers, all the things to build an Active Directory environment and never impact my home network. Another network type is host only network type. Again, complete isolation from external devices, but guests can see the host. What if I want to build an environment where I've got a powerful SQL database and I've got a bunch of guest accounts so that I can connect to that SQL database and really try out programming, uh, load balance, just all kinds of things. Now, SQL databases are pretty heavy duty. So your host would be an ideal place to put it and your clients could then access it. So host only network type really lends itself to that kind of an application. Here's a network diagram of the host only network mode. Here's a slightly different diagram of that same host only network type. Here's a different view of that same topology. I'm always amazed at some of the so cool things that VirtualBox has just kind of stuck in there. This one is so cool. This is UDP tunneling network where they are using some really cool tricks. So if I had a workstation somewhere on the internet and I've got one on my home network, I can actually build a tunnel from one virtual box across the globe to another virtual box. This is really cool. Now, VirtualBox has a rich command line interface. In fact, you can do just about everything with VirtualBox at a command prompt. You use the vboxmanage.exe and it provides you argument switches parameters for just about everything that we've ever talked about in VirtualBox in this series and much, much more. There's extensive documentation on all of this command line interface. Once you've installed VirtualBox, you point your command line prompt to program files, Oracle, VirtualBox, and then type vboxmanage. You're ready to go.